So for the last few weeks, we've been talking about the beginning, um, beginnings of Jesus' ministry. Uh, we talked about his baptism. We talked about his first miracle, turning the water into wine, and his uh, declaration of his mission as a light to the whole world. Uh, remember that he was standing up in the temple reading the scripture from Isaiah. So we did talk about those stuff. And today we see Jesus calling the first disciples to be part of his mission. And you know, we're, whenever we hear the phrase, you will fish for people, there's something about that phrase, you will fish for people, right? In fact, there are a lot going on uh, in today's text. Uh, first, we see that Jesus became so popular. He asked Simon to take him on the boat in order to teach the multitude, the crowd, on the shore. And I, I learned that because of the surface of, uh, surface of water kind of reflects the sound, uh, it's better to be on the water to speak to the people on the shore. Uh, that amplifies the sound. So something new that I learned. But then all of a sudden the story shifts. Next thing we know, we're in a miracle story. Jesus tells Peter to go out deeper into the lake and drop his nets. This was a direct encounter to these professional fishermen who caught nothing, absolutely nothing, after a long night of fishing. And a miracle happens, as we all know. A large number of fish was caught, so many that their nets begin to break, right? And there were so many fish that the boat begins to sink. And then the text shifts again after that. Now to a call story, a story of calling, where Jesus tells Peter, James, and John that they will be catching people instead of fishes. The question that we all have at certain points of life, either the year after graduating from college or, or the week you lost your job or the day that your child got sick or the moment someone affirmed your talent or the moment you were staring out the window during one of your same old, same old kind of day at work, the question emerges from our deepest consciousness. What should I do with my life? What should I do with my life? And in most cases, we don't go too deep exploring that question because, because it can be scary. It can be scary. It might mean some kind of a change in life. No wonder why Peter fell on his knees. Go away from me, Lord. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. But when we're talking about Christian vocation, being called by God, one thing we need to remember is that it's not about what we need or what we desire or what we want. Instead, vocation in Christian sense is what God wants from you. The talents God gives at birth are nothing compared to the gift of vocation. I read a book recently about personalities and there was this simple test like the personality test, which readers can do. And it told me that the positive traits of my type of personality are being organized, detail-oriented, uh, knowledgeable, analytical. Um, and I won't talk about the negative stuff. But, and it listed down typical jobs my style would have, right? The typical job that I would have, uh, my style would have. It said that I could do well as an accountant, Administrator, secretary, administrative assistant, uh, computer programmer, government worker, manual laborer, bank teller, and I like the uh, last one, or a truck driver. Truck driver. Yeah, I always wanted to be that. You know, I told you before that I, I would avoid anything. Uh, I, I would try do my best to avoid uh, any public speaking occasion uh, because it doesn't come natural to me. It's not a natural thing for me to do. I always have to remind myself every Sunday that I'm speaking to people who support me and care for me and love me. The point is that Christian calling, 
Christian calling is not about answering the question of what should I do with my life. Instead, it is the question, what do I want? Uh, instead of asking what do I want to do with me, the proper question that we should be asking is how is God having his or her or its way with me? That's the proper question. Here's an example from the Bible. We know that Paul was a tent maker, according to the book of Acts. He was a tent maker. But nowhere Paul is called to be a tent maker in the Bible. But instead, Paul was called to be an apostle. Right? He was called to spread the good news to the Gentiles that they were included in the promises of God. And from today's story, very story of fishermen, we are dealing with professional fishermen, Peter, John, and James. But they were not called to be a fisherman, the best thing they could do. But instead, they were called to be fishers of the people, right? But once again, the fear and anxiety kicks in just to think about a potential uncertainty that this might bring. I don't think I can do this, Jesus. I don't think I can do this. It's not natural to me, Jesus. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I'm not worthy enough. What Peter was in this story was Peter was representing the unworthiness to do God's work. But Jesus still goes back to the unworthy. Jesus responds back by saying, Fear not. Don't fear don't be afraid. Do you know how many times uh, this phrase, don't be afraid, appears in the, in the scripture? How many times? 365 times. 365 times. Coincidence? One a day. Don't fear. And we need to be clear that it is not the denial of the fear. We're not pretending the fear isn't there. But living through the fear, that's what's important. And that's when abundance is experienced. So I wonder, what if the disciples were swallowed up by this fear? What if disciples worried or doubted? Worried if their nets, which, uh, by the way, will get all dirty again without anything. You know, they just didn't, uh, wasn't successful just now of catching any fish. And they just finished cleaning them up. Yeah, that's a hard, like untangle them, cleaning them up, drying them. Or what if they were doubting? Should we even be listening to this person who is a carpenter? Probably doesn't know anything about fishing anyways, right? Or or what if they began to worry about, uh, worry when they saw the nest starting to break after all this fish was getting caught, that all the fishes will be loose if it breaks. Will they be still be doing what this carpenter was recommending them to do? Or were they worried if the boat would sink because of the weight, even if they were able to pull up all the fishes on deck? If they have chosen to live into any of their worries and fears and anxieties at that time, would we be hearing the same story as we heard it today? February 14th is coming up. Do you know what day that that is? February 14th? Valentine's Day. Good. Good. For the Methodist pastors... February 14th means something different. (laughs) It is a deadline to submit our statistical report for the previous year. Every year, February 14th, that's our due date. I don't know. Yeah, I I think they meant to do that, to just uh, make our life harder. And I worked on them a few weeks ago. Uh, One of the things that I realized was a drop in our... Uh, one of our numbers. Uh, we grew in budget, we grew in uh, membership, we grew in our number of ministries, we grew in the number of uh, people participating in ministries. 
but one number dropped. The one number that dropped was average worship attendance. From 2015, 2016, 2017, it was 61, 63, 62. So we are in that uh, 60 average. And then for 2018, the average worship attendance was 56. So it dropped, right? And I can tell myself that number isn't important. Number isn't the point, of, uh, after all. But if I start to worry about these numbers, I can go all the way deep into my uh, deepest valley. You know, what did I do wrong last year? <laughs> Was it my preaching? And then it can go all the way down to hurt my self-esteem, right? But the point I want to make is that it's not to make you feel better or anything because you are here today, so that's good. <laughs> but the point I want to make, to make is that uh, I choose not to live into the worries and fears itself, not that I'm going to deny the numerical facts. Certainly there is an area that we can improve. There is an area I can and should be improving. It is helpful for us to learn about the areas that we can do better and we will do better. And I think about uh, where I feel most alive. I think about where, when I feel most alive. And no, without any doubt, it is Sunday mornings. It is Sunday mornings. And that's why I'm a, uh, why I'm a pastor. It wasn't because I had all the right skill set to, to uh, revive uh, Trinity, um, but, but this is where I feel most alive. Not because I'm the best preacher in the world, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was more about me saying, if you say so, God, I'll do it. If you say so. If you say so. Another aspect of the disciples' uh, response we need to pay attention to is that instead of living into the fear, what they did was they call on their partners, right? Remember that part of the story? They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. That's what they did, right? It's a teamwork. We need each other, right? Jesus never worked alone. If you remember, the very first thing he did was to go out and find, uh, find partners to work with him. So, uh, I don't know if you knew about this, but in the back of your bulletin, there are some, um, in the bottom of back of your bulletin, you can see what is written right next to ministers. What does it say under ministers? The entire congregation. The entire congregation. It was like that from I don't know when, but <laughs> early on since I was here, right? The entire congregation is the minister. And I'm just a equipping pastor, right? We are all ministers. And um, I've been reading uh, Beekner a lot uh, past weeks, um, but quoting once again from Frederick Beekner, and this is what he said about ministers. The first ministers were the 12 disciples. There is no evidence that Jesus chose them because they were brighter or nicer than other people. In fact, the New Testament record suggests that they were continually missing the point jockeying for position and and the chips were down when, when the chips were down interested in nothing so much as saving their own skins their sole qualification seems to have been their initial willingness to rise to their feet when jesus said follow me as saint paul put it uh, later in 1 corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame 
the strong. When Jesus sent the twelve out into the world, his instructions were simple. He told them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal with the implication that to do either right uh, implication that to do either right was in effect to do both. Fortunately, fortunately, for the world in general and the church in particular, the ability to do them is not dependent on either moral character or IQ. To do them in the name of Christ is to be a minister. In the name of Christ, not to do them is to be a bad joke. This is what he said. To do them in the name of Christ is to be a minister. In the name of Christ, not to do them is to be a bad joke. The understanding that we are all in this together is so crucial in doing God's work. Now, moving on, what did they do after they caught these, with partners, caught these miraculous number of fish? It surely was the peak of their fishing career, right? It was the biggest achievement they ever dreamt of. They won the lottery, right? And there was this huge crowd witnessing them. They're on the stage right now. They got the spotlight. But what did they do with the fishes? They left it. They left it right there. So today, I want to encourage you to do the things that you don't feel like doing, that Jesus nudges you. I want to encourage you to offer your stuff that might be your time, your resource, whatever it is, and say, here I am, Lord. Right? How was all possible? How was this all possible? And this is where we want to bring everything back to the most important distinction between the calling story from, from the Gospel of Luke uh, in comparison to the call stories in the book of Gospel of Mark and Matthew. They all have call stories, but they're different. What made all of this possible? In the Gospel of Luke, there was a pre-existing relationship. And this was a moment of epiphany in that relationship. Unlike the other versions in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, where Jesus randomly shows up to the first disciples at the shore, in the Gospel of Luke, this is not the first time we hear about Simon Peter. Actually, Jesus stays with Simon Peter at his house before this happens. So instead of waiting for the miraculous falling off the horse type of calling in your life, instead of waiting to be clear on what we want or what we desire and when we want this calling thing to happen to us, our task, our task may be is to wake up every morning, is to wake up every morning and ask, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. What do you want me to do today? Every morning, when you open your eyes, ask Jesus, here I am, Lord. What do you want me to do today? Jesus called his disciples to leave their nets and follow him. The good news is that he called us he called each one of us, not because of who we are or who we were, but because of who we could be later. So what we need today is that willingness to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen.